Greetings, Earthers, Martians, Belters, members of the OPA. Welcome to the fourth episode of Expanse, the unofficial podcast. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker, and joining me on the show today is Nikki Starwalker. Hello, Lex. Welcome to the show, Nikki. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, so we're we're doing our fourth episode today, and we're going to continue our series on the cast and characters of The Expanse. Yay! And I'm very happy to say that, that to my knowledge at least, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Nikki, but okay. we don't have any corrections or retractions this week. No, we do not. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no retractions, no corrections. So that's good. Maybe we're continuing to improve. Yes, it's quite an achievement for us. And I also didn't get any hate mail about <laughs> any of my uh, confessions last week uh, that I thought sure would invoke some kind of nerd rage in someone. But if it did, they they didn't write me to tell me. Yay, so, we have nice listeners. Yeah, or at least... Uh, Tolerant ones? Or, or ones that, that can exert some self-control and don't feel the need to, to tell me that I pissed them off. <laughs> they just quietly unsubscribed and Aww. never hear from them. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so uh, before we get into our topic today, I just want to mention real quickly that Peter Grulka, I'm going to guess is how you say that, uh, is helping manage the wiki for The Expanse, and he's kind of put out a call for anyone who is willing to help out by submitting to The Expanse Wiki and, and helping uh, them, you know, get it up to speed and, and get it, everything up there that they can. And something that they're doing that I think is pretty cool is they're actually splitting the wiki up into two sections. So there's going to be a section for the books and another one for the TV show. Ah, okay. And I think that's a really good idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you're someone who's going to be watching the show and you haven't read the books, you can still go to the wiki for more information and hopefully avoid reading any spoilers that you don't want to see. Mm -hmm. And the other good reason is that I think chances are good that, you know, not everything's going to be the same between the books and the TV show. And without kind of dividing it up like that, it could get kind of confusing when there are differences. Like, what are what are we talking about? Right, yeah, right? that's a great idea. Yeah, so I don't know if there's something like this for uh, Game of Thrones slash The Song of Ice and Fire, mm -hmm. but I know that Peter said he is getting inspiration from the, uh, what's it called, The Walking Dead Okay. Uh, because it's a, a similar situation there where I guess that's based on books, which I didn't even know that, um, but I, I don't really watch it. But <laughs> where, you know, you have the TV franchise and then the books and, and there are some differences. And I guess that's how their wiki is set up is they kind of have two different areas. I so. see. Okay. So, yeah. So if you're the kind of person to like type in the wikis and, and put in accurate information and not just make stuff up then uh, definitely go contribute to the Expanse Wiki and otherwise uh, go check it out. If you can't find it, which if you just Google Expanse, it should come up or Expanse Wiki, you can head to the show notes of episode one at starwalkerstudios.com slash Expanse and we have a link to it there. Perfect. All right. So on to our main topic. So today we are discussing Stephen Strait, who is going to be playing James Holden. Yeah. So we kind of the way we do these is we start out and we talk a bit about the actor so that if you don't immediately know who Stephen Strait is, maybe you've seen him in something and you just don't realize it and, and we can help you out with that. And then we'll talk a bit about the character and again, doing, doing everything we can to stay spoiler free. That's right. <laughs> So, Nikki, um, you've got the tablet over there. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Stephen Strait? Sure, I will. And Lex, feel free to jump in here. Uh, Stephen Strait was born in New York, so he is an American. Yay! And he actually did not like acting, if IMDb is to be believed. Okay. He didn't like acting when he was a child. You see a lot of these actors 
that say, oh, I always knew I wanted to be on stage. I always knew I wanted to act for a living. Um, but he did not. He grew into it, kind of. He, his parents put him into acting school, and he started to enjoy it. He has been in quite a few things, so I'm just going to name a few of his credits that you might recognize. Okay, fair he enough. He was, yeah, he was in The Covenant. He played someone named Caleb. Um, he was also in 10,000 BC, and he was in a TV show called Magic City that was on Stars. And in that, he actually played someone named Stevie Evans. So you may know him from those things. Now he is, of course, in The Expanse, where he plays Jim Holden. And I actually watched a few interviews of his, and I feel like he's going to really bring a lot to this role because he's read all the books and he's oh, really, wow. yeah, he's really into the series and he's studied the world. He seems to genuinely appreciate the world. And he said in one of his interviews that having the authors there in the writer's room was an invaluable resource to him. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And I've probably read, you know, some of the same stuff you have. But one thing that I read that he'd said that was really cool is he's really into sci-fi. So, you know, not only has he read these books, but he's just into sci-fi in general, which is awesome. And, you know, that's something that's, that's really cool that I've seen with a lot of these actors, you know, especially the ones that are, that are active on Twitter, is they seem very enthusiastic for the show. Uh, Steven Stray, Dominique Tipper, and Cass Anvar? Yeah. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but they're all very, seem to be very excited from what I see of their tweets on Twitter. They're all anxiously awaiting the premiere and, and to see what we all think of the show. And and I think that's awesome. I think that says a lot for everything about the show, that the actors are so excited about it. It's a, it's a very good sign. Yes, definitely. Some actors do not read the books that their TV shows are based on. And that's, believe I believe, because they want to just um, be in the world that the screenwriters want them to be in. They don't want to have that kind of uh, the background from the books because it changes the vision maybe and maybe changes how they act. I'm not sure. But I love it when an actor does read the material and really gets into it. Um, it just feels like he's going to be cooler with the fans because he's going to understand where they're coming from and he's going to appreciate the love that people have for the books. Yeah, I don't know. It, unless, you know, you're in an adaptation of a book for TV or a movie and they're just completely changing everything about it. That sounds like a cop out to me and just an excuse for laziness. Like, I, I mean, I'm not an actor, but I would think as an actor playing a role, you would want as much information about your character as you could get. You know, mm -hmm. so why would you not tap into that other resource, even if maybe your director is doing some things differently, then at least you can be like, well, hey, in the book, you know, the character did this or, or said this. So maybe, you know, we should take this approach or at least have some feedback about what the director is doing. Because, you know, I've seen from like behind the scenes stuff that a lot of times the actors can have a, a pretty large influence on things like the dialogue and just what the characters end up doing because mm -hmm. the actor could be like, you know, I just don't think my character would do this or I just don't think my character would say this. Right. And the director's, you know, got a million things going on, right? Yeah. And, and maybe the actor catches something that the director just missed and he's like, oh yeah, I, I guess you're right. That doesn't really make sense. Right. And, and it's very much a, a collaborative, you know, so unless you yeah. have a director that's like, I don't want you to read the books because I'm doing something totally different. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, why are you basing something off a book anyway, other than just to get some easy ticket sales? You know, if you're yeah. going to do something totally different, then do your own thing. Don't <laughs> don't like, you know, take someone else's work and then completely change it because I, I just don't get that. It's like you're just being lazy. It's like do your own thing. <laughs> I hear you. And you have a little bit of a biased point of view, though, because you're also an author. Yeah. And you don't want to see your work like twisted up and changed in such a way that you can't recognize it anymore. <laughs> well, and I'm also a reader. 
That's true. You know, and just for example, as a hypothetical, I'm, I don't for a minute think that anything like this would happen, but let's say the expanse comes out and it's completely different from the books. Okay. And not just, oh, we're going to introduce characters in a different order or we're going to not have certain characters in it and add new characters. Like that kind of stuff, depending how it's done, like may or may not bother me, but I'm talking about like just, it's totally different. Like there's aliens and time travel and people teleporting from place to place. You know, they just make <laughs> it completely different. Like I would be pissed and, really? and I would feel like this isn't the expanse. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This is something else. And they're putting the expanse label on it. And it's like false advertising. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So as a reader, you know, if I'm someone who's read The Song of Ice and Fire and I go and watch Game of Thrones, I at least want to be able to recognize it as the song of ice and fire. I mean, yeah, maybe they do different things with it, which is fine mm -hmm. and, pro and usually good. You know, you just can't translate a book to a TV show without, you know. But if, if it was, you know, not at all the same, like I would not be happy. And I, I think anybody else who read the books would not be happy. Okay, yeah. So I don't, I don't know, but I'm, I'm glad that he's read the books. It, it makes me wonder how many of the actors have read any of the books. Me too. I kind of go into TV shows assuming, well, TV shows that are based on books, assuming that most of the actors have not read right. the books. Right. Um, so that just stuck out to me that he's actually really into the world and into sci-fi. I would not be shocked to learn that Dominique Tipper read the books because she is like so excited <laughs> about the experience. She just tweeted today about how she's counting down to the premiere. And yep. she, she had a, <laughs> this is totally an aside, but she had a picture of like her director's chair yeah. that said Dominique Tipper. And then it said Naomi. And then uh, Ty and, and Daniel were like, you know, did you quote unquote steal your chair? Cause we did. And she's like, I may or may not have. <laughs> and I was kind of like, how can you steal something that has your name on it? How is that not your chair? They put your name on it. It's not like they can use it for someone else now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the writers actually feel like they're invading the set or invading the writer's room. <laughs> That's the feeling I get from their Twitter. And it seems to me that it's an unusual thing for writers to be invited onto the set and be such a part of the production process. I don't think it's unusual to have them invited to the set, but I, I do think it's fa fairly unusual for them to have as much um, input okay. as Ty and Daniel seem to have, mm -hmm. which is awesome. That's what I want to see. If, if some book or series of books that I love is going to be made into a movie or a TV show, I want the writers involved every step of the way because otherwise it's not going to be what you want. Right. You know, and I, I think it's kind of pretentious for someone to say, I'm going to take these series of books that are New York Times bestsellers and have all these fans and I'm going to put it on the screen. But I somehow, <laughs> even <laughs> though these writers have, have created this thing out of nothing that's become very successful, I am somehow better than them and have better ideas about how the characters should be portrayed or how the story should unfold. So I'm just going to change everything left and right about it. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> if you're so awesome, then create your own thing from nothing. And let's see how that does. Right. But, you know, if you're going to take The Expanse, you know, you need to at least honor what's what's there and and do your best to be true to that, you know. Yep. Which, which again, you know, there there are going to be concessions that have to be made. You know, I think we've talked about on the show before, like my theory about why they're bringing a Vassarala in, like basically a book early is because I think they'll use her for exposition and, and to help inform us, the audience, about kind of the political situation and whatnot that in the novels, it's very easy to kind of clue us into that as we go. But unless you can have some characters having a conversation about it, it's really difficult to do that in like a TV show. Yes. You need a way to show that. And Avasarala is like the perfect way to do that because she's like elbows deep in the politics. So you can have a quick little scene with her 
and just reveal all this information about kind of how the world works, Mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Yep. And I think that's a a smart move. And and there's going to be things like that where you just, you know, you have to do something different because you just can't do it the way it's done in a book because it's just not going to work. Right. But that's a very different thing to just completely changing characters, like who they are or changing the plot or changing, oh, no, we're going to have faster than light travel or we're going to have time machines or stuff like that. Like that would change what The Expanse is. Like The Expanse, I would say, I would call it mundane science fiction. Right. And that would make it not mundane science fiction anymore. And I apologize. I'm, I'm going to try to <laughs> fix this in, in post-production. But if you're hearing what sounds like rustling paper in the background... <laughs> Our, our cat's favorite toy is an old Amazon box with the packing paper still in it. <laughs> and for some reason, whenever we start recording this show, she thinks it's a great time to do something really noisy. And today <laughs> she, she chose to get in her box and play with the paper. So I, I've now taken it away. And, and now I'm getting hurt looks from the cat. Like, what did I do? Aww. But yeah. So if you heard that, that's what that was. <laughs> Some Foley action going on here. Well, she's got to remodel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. So I feel like we, we just got on a huge tangent. We were talking about Stephen Strait, and you, you mentioned some things he was in. I have not seen any of those things. I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't ever seen him in anything. Um, it's funny because you mentioned 10,000 BC, and I remember seeing trailers for that. Okay. And I was really excited to see it because like, I'm really into you know, prehistory and stuff like that. And I never saw it. And I don't remember why I suspected I saw a, like a longer trailer or I saw a review or something that made me think it wasn't going to be very good or whatever, but I never saw that. So maybe, maybe I have to check that out. Okay. Yeah. He was also in a movie called Stop Loss, which I had heard of, meant to see and didn't see it yet. And he was in City Island where he played a character named Tony. Okay. And you may just recognize his face because as a teenager, he earned recognition as a fashion model. Oh, interesting. So he will be a pretty face on the ship. (laughs) Well, I have to say uh, just the fact that the title of the movie is 10 BC and and not 10 BCE kind of worries me. But Oh, okay. That could just be uh, to make it more like user friendly. Yeah. Some people might be like, what's BCE? What's that mean? <laughs> Everybody knows what BC means. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have to see that because I was really um, excited about seeing that and then I never saw it for some reason. Okay. I'll watch that with you. Hopefully it won't be like 300. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we couldn't Wait, even make it through that one. Well, no, that was the sequel to it. Oh, okay. I, I saw 300 long after it came out and I remember, you know, just hearing so much about how awesome and groundbreaking this movie was, you know, and maybe part of the problem was it was overhyped, but I finally saw 300 and I thought it was terrible. Yeah. I think I maybe got through it. I might not have even watched the whole thing. Like it was definitely bad enough that I would normally turn it off, but I think I might've actually watched the whole thing thinking, well, surely it gets better at some point (laughs) because I've heard so many good things about it. And yeah, yeah, Never got better. Just kept getting worse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then they made another one. Yeah. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about Stephen Strait. So so maybe you recognize him from from one of those movies and things that he's been in. Nikki and I are have have no previous ex- experience with St- Stephen Strait. So I really like this. I like that for the most part they're getting actors that aren't like household names. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Which yeah. is not to say they're not successful or, or anything like that, but it's not like Tom Hanks or, or something where like everybody knows who that person is. And, and I think that's really important for a show like that mm-hmm. or like this because I don't know why. I, I guess just because, you know, those actors are already associated with other roles. Right. You know, and even if they're not typecast, it's still like they kind of bring all that with them in your mind when you see them in, in something like this. And and I like the especially for me, I've I've seen Thomas Jane in, in a couple things, and I'm sure I've seen Wes Chatham in something, although I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, but other than that, like most of the people in the expanse, I'm like 
I don't think I've ever seen them in anything. Or if I did, they were like a supporting character that I didn't really, you know, take note of or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like that, like that, that makes me really excited because it's like, you know, I get to see these, these, for me, new actors and, and see what they bring and, you know, really associate them with this particular right. character. Mm -hmm. It's like Jonathan Banks, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's a great actor, like nothing against Jonathan Banks. But every time I see him, I think of Breaking Bad. Yes. <laughs> and and it's just like, it's always going to be that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's in like one episode and we theorized about what, what character he might be playing. I kind of suspect he might be a character that was made for the TV show. Yeah. Um, I can't f think of one from the book, so I agree with you. Yeah, I can't think of one from the first book that would just be in one episode. Mm -hmm. my, my initial theory was that he was going to be Havelock, mm -hmm. but then I saw that he's only in one episode, and I'm like, well, unless they're going to do something very different with Havelock, he would be in more than one ep – he'd probably be in at least half of the episodes, if not more, of the right. first season. So I'm not sure who, who he's going to play, but I'm kind of glad. Again, nothing against Jonathan Banks. I, I think he's an awesome actor, but I'm glad that he's not like one of the starring characters that's going to be in the show because it's like, I, I don't know. I, I'd rather see new faces, you know, that can really make these roles their own instead of like, oh, he's kind of like Mike from Breaking Bad. <laughs> Or we're at least comparing him to Mike, right? We're like, oh, he's like him in this way and not like him in that way. And yeah. Unfortunately, whenever I see him on the screen, no matter what character he's playing, his name is Mike to me. <laughs> well, in the roles I've seen him play, other than that, are all very similar. It's like people are casting him mm -hmm. in that same kind of role. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like he's not Mike, but he's a character very much like Mike. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So That makes it harder to separate him. Now I just always hear him say, tonight is the night the Batman died. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing some Arkham Knight lately. So That's right. That is him, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right. Well, let's chat about Jim Holden. Yes, let's, before we get too derailed here. <laughs> okay. So Jim was originally from Montana, and he took a position. Wait, wait. Oh, before okay. you go any further. Okay. I, I really want to stop there and talk about his beginnings in Montana, because he had what might seem, at least to fellow Americans, mm -hmm. A very unusual uh, family situation. I forget what they called it, like an extended family or something like that, where he had multiple parents. Mm -hmm. Like, multi I think he had multiple mothers, multiple fathers. I mean, obviously, they weren't all biologically, or were they? Did they do some weird, like, <laughs> genetic thing where all these people were biologically his mother and father, or was no, it? No, I, I don't think so. But it was just like a, like a family group. Kind of thing, right? Instead of like our idea of the nuclear family of one man, one woman, or two men, or two whatever, you know, like Correct. they had like like a group that was that was their family, and and that's really cool. And on Earth in this time, that is not at all unusual. Mm -hmm. It's pretty normal. That's right. It's really neat. And so he was raised by all of these people, and so he called multiple people mother. Yes. Yeah, and that's really neat. Um, and he, in the book, he'll talk about, oh, this reminds me of mother so-and-so or mother so-and-so. So, -and -so. so yeah. I love that. That's interesting. And it really breaks the norms. Yeah. And as someone who studied a lot of anthropology, like I just love that because we as Americans, or even if you're listening in another country, it's probably very similar. You know, we have so many blinders on mm -hmm. that most of us die <laughs> And never even realized that we were going through life with these these cultural blinders. And, you know, a huge one is what you think a family is. You know, in our um, conception of the nuclear family, many of us may assume that that's just the way it is. Well, it's not. <laughs> that's the way it is for us in our culture. But there are many, many cultures, you know, right now and through history that had very different conceptions of what a family is and and how do you decide who you're related to and who you're not. Right. And it's so very rare that you see any of that 
in any kind of like popular fiction Mm -hmm. or anything like that. And that obviously Ty or Daniel or both of them, you know, have had some uh, exposure to cultural anthropology because they have this conception of, oh, families can be different. Right. And that's really cool. And, And I, I like the kind of optimistic idea that in just a few hundred years, you know, we will have changed culturally that much. Yes. You know, I'm not sure that I agree with that optimism. I would love to think that we could change that much in that little time. Um, You know, I mean, here we are in our day and age, and some people are still struggling with the idea that, you know, gay people should have the same rights as everybody else and should be able to marry and, th- you know, yeah. and, and so it's hard to imagine, like, we're still in this kind of dark age culturally mm-hmm. that in 200 years we could be at a place where a family like what Holden had is considered normal and no one even thinks twice about it. Right. Yeah. And in his world, that grew out of a necessity. Right. So I could understand that maybe we're forced into the situation and we have to change and adjust our thinking. Well, that's how family happened in the beginning. It Mm -hmm. grew out of necessity of, you know, needing, (laughs) needing help rearing those children because it's a, just a, a, a biological fact that a woman with a kid on her hip in her arm, um, she's only got one hand left and it's going to be hard to hunt (laughs) <laughs> and provide for her family all by herself, mm-hmm. you know. So you need you need help, you know, and, and that's where the family came from. You Interesting. Know? So I, I just, I like that. I like the thought that's put into things like that and, and also like the biology. You know, it's amazing. You know, science fiction <laughs> spends all this time worrying about astronomy and physics, mm-hmm. you know, how are we going to explain how people go to different star systems and stuff like that? And then they'll just completely get the biology wrong. It's like they <laughs> don't even make the, the smallest attempt to understand the most basic biology and what can and can't happen. And it's so awesome to see a science fiction series where the authors actually have some concept of biology and actually use that to make the story more interesting. Right. Yeah. You and know, they, they really seem to care about getting it right when it's to, when it's um, important to get it right. For instance, you know, things that they don't want to specify, like their, their space travel. They don't go into great detail on how that works, right. I don't think. And they do that on purpose so that, you know, it can't be proven later that that's not possible. <laughs> well, and it also doesn't matter. Right. Un- unless you have a point in the story where it really matters how exactly the fusion reactor works then it, it doesn't matter and it's a waste of time right. to go into it. And and when they do go into the biology, it's because it matters. And I, I can't really give examples without spoiling, but they're, you know, what will be future seasons of the show, there are really cool things that happen because of how biology works. Mm-hmm. That's And, and it, it is fundamental to the story. It's not like they're just going to give us a biology lesson for the hell of it. Precisely. It's like it matters. Yeah. <laughs> it changes the way things happen. So. <laughs> But we'll see some of that um, in the first season. And and I can't wait until we see it on the show. And, and I'm going to be vague here so that people who've read the books know what I'm talking about. And people that haven't are like, what, it, what is he talking about? Um, but there's a great interview. I think it was uh, Ty and Daniel were interviewed on the Adventures in Science Fiction Publishing podcast. Okay. And I think it was on that interview Uh, that they were talking about, there's something that happens in the first book biologically Mm -hmm. that people were criticizing them for and saying that it was so unrealistic, it kicked them out of the story. And it turns out that not only is that realistic, but it was based on an actual real thing happening in the world today. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember what I'm talking about? No, I don't. <laughs> it's it's a certain biological function that we see later on in the story. It, it's a pretty big moment in the story when we see this happening. And yeah, some people were like, oh, that's so cheesy. That's so unrealistic. And it's like, no, that's actually directly taken from something real world. And yeah, that's the way it happens. Wow. So, <laughs> if anybody wants to know what I'm talking about, you can email me at expansepodcast <laughs> at gmail.com. I will happily... Uh, talk to you about it. I just don't want to spoil anything 
for everybody. Yeah, and I appreciate that. So we finally have the the episode about Jim Holden because he's come up in pretty much every episode because yeah. he's such a pivotal character to the story. So he grew up in Montana and uh, had this, what for him was very normal family. But in, we should point out that it's normal on Earth. Mm-hmm. So some of the belters are kind of like, oh, those weird Earthlings with their crazy extended families. So, so <laughs> right. that's kind of cool. Very cool. So then after growing up in Montana, he was in Earth's Navy. Yes. Which he got kicked out of. Yes. <laughs> because Jim is the type of person that does not want to take orders from anyone. He kind of just wants to live his own life by his own rules. Well, that's part of it. And part of it is that he doesn't want to be responsible mm-hmm. for, you know, he wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to do what he thinks is right. And that's it. He doesn't want to have to be responsible for things bigger than himself because, you know, those things quickly get very complicated and messy and he doesn't want to be responsible for other people, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, we've talked about on the show how he's kind of the reluctant leader. Right. And that's part of the reason why. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. And he's the type of person I feel that has a lot of honor and can easily get wrapped up in other people's ordeals to the point where he has to see it through. Yeah, he's an honorable person, but I would say at least at the beginning of the story, he's also um, in some ways very narrow-minded, has a hard time seeing from someone else's perspective, and is very naive about how the world really works and how people really work. Mm -hmm. He's one of those people where like, he's a good, decent person, and he's pretty straightforward in the way he thinks you know, he's not devious or cunning or anything like that. And he tends to think that everybody else thinks the way that he does. Yes. And he's continually shocked and surprised when he's forced to confront the fact that they don't <laughs> think the way that he does. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's relatable. Yes. Um, we're definitely. all in our own heads. So, of course, we can easily picture somebody else thinking the exact same way that we do. <laughs> and I'm not the first person to say this. And I'm sure I won't be the last, but I think that looking back, you know, years in the future, looking back on this, I think that will be the number one thing that will be acknowledged as what made this show the success that I think it's going to be is that, yeah, it's it's science fiction, space opera, mundane science fiction, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, it's a story about people. Mm-hmm. And these people are very real and relatable to us today, even though this is in the future, even though the world they live in, in a lot of ways, is very different from the world we live in. Human nature is human nature. I mean, you look back in recorded history, you know, we've got, what, a couple, two, three thousand years of recorded history, and human nature has changed how much in that time? Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. You see the same shit happening today that you saw happening in ancient Rome and, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's conceivable and and I think uh, not not a stretch to assume that things weren't much different even farther back beyond what we have records for. Mm -hmm. So to think that in a mere few hundred years that anything's going to be different as far as people and how they behave and how they treat each other, I don't think it's going to be any different. And and that's a criticism that I've heard leveled at Star Trek a lot that I think is completely valid is it's sometimes hard to relate to characters in Star Trek because everybody's so perfect, you know, and, and it's almost like humans have changed somehow and we're not as petty and as backstabbing and as selfish as we used to be. Yes. And it's like, unless you're talking thousands upon thousands of years in the future, like probably tens of thousands of years in the future, like it's not realistic Mm -hmm. because we haven't changed in 3000 years. Why, why would we change in the next thousand years? Yeah, that's a very fair point. Do you remember when Star Trek takes place? It's hundreds of years in the future. I don't remember exactly how many, but it's the 20 something century. So okay. it's, I think it's like three or 400 years. Some, and, and it depends if you're talking original series or next generation, because next generation is like 70 some years after the original series. But yeah, it's not nearly far enough ahead for human nature to have changed. Right. At all. Okay. You know? And it's like, 
I mean, not to get on a Star Trek tangent, but <laughs> but they do try to show that. Like, you have your criminals, and you know, but mm-hmm. they're always like, everybody's like, oh, they're the weird one. You know, they're a killer or whatever. You know, we don't have war. We don't have disease, blah, blah. Even though they have wars all the time, just not with each other, I guess. Right, yeah. It's still with the outside. It's just the other has changed, you know, mm-hmm. where for human history up to this point, the other is a human who is not part of your tribe or culture or whatever you want to call it, your nation, whatever Mm -hmm. you want to call it, you know, in Star Trek, the other is someone of another species, but it's still, oh, they're not like us. So we're not going to treat them the way we treat ourselves. I see. You know, and, and that's, that's a problem (laughs) with humanity. I mean, you, you can see it today. It's not hard to imagine how we would treat aliens if we encountered them. Because look at how we treat the other life forms yep. on our planet. And it's like people use the excuse of, oh, well, they're not intelligent or they're not sentient. It's like, really? So does how you treat another person, is that dependent on how smart they are? <laughs> you know, if they take an IQ test and they score really low, does that mean you can steal from them and you can kill them and you can beat them up and it's okay because they're not as smart as you? <laughs> Not to mention some of these animals are possibly very intelligent and, you know, look at, look at how they're treated. Yep. So, and look at how we treat each other. Look at how we treat other humans who are of a different religion or a different nationality or a different sexuality or a different skin color. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, we'll use any excuse. Exactly. And, and it's just, it's a thing of seeing someone else as the other as different as outside of your group. However you want to define that, it could be that they have a different religion or they don't have a religion, (gasps) or it could be that they look different or they talk different or they eat different foods. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be really stupid reasons. Or they smell different. Right. And, you know, as humans, you know, you can take any two humans and those two people have far more in common than they have differences just Mm -hmm. because biologically we're human. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we can't get along. So imagine if we met a whole nother species. Oh, yeah. That would just be catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's it's not surprising that, you know, in 200 years that hasn't changed. That's right. And I think that's very realistic. And so all the, you know, tangents abound. But I think that, that this show is going to appeal to people, even people that aren't huge into sci-fi. Oh, yeah. Because ultimately it's a human drama and it has relatable characters that you can relate to today. Mm -hmm. And I think in the future, looking back, we'll be like, that's why it was successful. It wasn't the awesome special effects. It wasn't even the awesome actors or the awesome writing. It was the the characters, we can relate to them, the stories, we can relate to them. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. But I think you can have an amazing story, but if the acting and the writing isn't there you won't get that message across to the viewers. Oh, definitely. So it's it's a big pie and you want to eat it all together. Yeah. I mean, that's a bad analogy, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It well, takes everything. You, you could also have a show with great actors and great writing, but if the characters aren't relatable, it's not going to do well. Correct. Either. Yeah. So yeah, you got to You got to get it all right. It's not easy. All in all, we're really excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think they're going to get it right. And uh, this could be one of the biggest sci-fi shows of, of our day, yeah, if I'm, not the biggest. I'm hoping that it'll bring in people that aren't genre fans or sci-fi fans, like you're saying, that don't necessarily uh, watch things like Star Trek and Star Wars, but they just, they really want to see an interesting series about a detective, you know, and a a mystery about a missing girl and that kind of stuff. And they'll end up loving sci-fi and we will get more sci-fi. Well, and look at how successful Battlestar Galactica was. Yeah, that's true. Um, People are still talking about Battlestar Galactica and and people are, you know, almost every day I hear someone saying, oh, you know, Expanse is going to be the next Battlestar Galactica. And I always almost bite my tongue off because I personally detested (laughs) Battlestar Galactica. (laughs) But it did have human, you know, the characters were not superhuman like in Star Trek where it's like they're all goody two-shoe moral paragons. Mm -hmm. You know, they were very relatable in that they were flawed human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what 
the story was really about, right? It, it wasn't about so much science fiction stuff. It was about people. Mm-hmm. And I think even though there's a lot about that show that I didn't like and that led to me not watching much of it beyond, what, the first season I think we watched? Yeah. It was still really successful, and it was successful beyond just a science fiction audience for those reasons. So I, in that way, I hope that, that The Expanse is like it. Yes, me too. Just not in the other way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, maybe, maybe I'll get some hate mail about that one. Expansepodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Let's hear from the BSG fans telling me how cracked I am that I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that one. It wasn't my favorite either. All right. Um, so Jim does all this. He, he grows up in Montana, kicks out of the Navy. He takes a job on the Canterbury hauling ice. Yes, ice hauler. That's right. And and I did, I think I made a, a slight mistake. <laughs> okay. In one of the previous episodes, I, I said that the ice haulers go to the asteroid belt and get big chunks of ice and then take it where it's needed. Yeah. It's actually not the asteroid belt. And again, I, I might get this wrong because I'm going by memory. But later I was like, wait a minute, that wasn't right. It's, I, think it's the, I think it's the rings of Saturn. Okay. Is that where the ice is coming from? Do you remember? I don't remember. I, I'm pretty sure it was a planetary ring. I think it's Saturn um, because I'm pretty sure there's not like big chunks of ice just floating around in the asteroid belt. But anyway, they're going somewhere and getting big chunks of ice that they then use as a water supply for the various colonies in the belt and and beyond. Yes. And it's a a hard job. It's probably manual labor and a lot of lifting and dragging and pulling. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, you're you're dealing with these massive blocks of ice in zero G. So the slightest mistake could lead to. Uh, hor- horrific injury or death. Mm-hmm. And because of all this, you have long flights, right? From yeah. you go get the ice and then you're flying, I don't know wh- what it was, probably months to get to where you're going. So it's a lot of time with not a whole lot to do with a, a relatively small amount of people on a ship. And so it's not like, it's not a job that people want. No. So the people on this ship tend to be there because they don't have anywhere else to go. And they tend to have what we call checkered paths. Like (laughs) usually there's some reason that they're there and they're not somewhere better, you know, like holding got kicked out of the earth Navy, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and so it's kind of assumed that everyone on the ship has something in their past that they're either running from, or they just don't want people to know about. Mm -hmm. And so that's something to keep in mind because all these characters kind of have that in common. And there's this kind of understanding among them that like, there's something about each of you that I probably don't know. It's probably not good, Mm -hmm. but we're in this together kind of thing. Yes. So, and some of those things come out as the story unfolds and and they're really interesting. They are. (laughs) (laughs) No spoilers. (laughs) Darn it. Did you have anything else over there? I will add that the his family group, I looked it up just now, his family group is called a co-op, and he has okay. five fathers and three mothers. Awesome. Thank you for looking that up. Sure. He's actually an only child. Which is probably, an, is that unusual or not? I don't know. I would say it's not. Yeah, I think I think it's not. I think they actually have some kind of population control where you have to apply to have children kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, which I can definitely foresee happening. Yeah, we need that now. Yeah. (laughs) Big time. (laughs) Quit breeding, people. Oh, my God. (laughs) You got to have voluntary population control or it's going to be non-voluntary. So let's let's make it voluntary while we still can. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. We're doing our part, right, Nikki? Yes. We're kid-free and loving it. Yes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I, I guess we're getting away from from talking about if someone's our favorite character or not, because we've decided that we can't really have favorites. I've said before, in the first book, I was not a Holden fan. I was much more of a Miller fan. Whenever they came into contract, 
contract conflict. I was always on Miller's side. I always thought Miller made more sense and Holden just like needed a good talking to. But he does really grow on me in the later books. And I'd say I'm, I've read book five now. Like I'm a huge Holden fan now. Like I love the way he grows and changes and he becomes what he needs to be, which involves sometimes admitting he's wrong or, you know, growing or, or learning, Hey, you know, these things I believed I I can't go on like this. And I, it takes a big person to do that. I think a lot of people can't or won't do that. So I I really get a lot of respect for him as, as the story goes on. And I mean, he's got to start some, I mean, to have an arc, he can't start out like got all the shit together, right? (laughs) That's right. But it's very fascinating for me to hear that from you. I'm very used to hearing you talk about Holden as someone that kind of annoys you because of his behavior. Yeah, well, I'm I'm usually talking about him in the first book. Cause right. I, that's all I can really talk about right now. So That's true. Yeah. I, I have a feeling he'll be less annoying on the TV show. Mm-hmm. If only because Stephen Strait is so good looking. It's kind of hard <laughs> to be annoyed by someone that good looking. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> It's well, like, well, he he's so cute, though, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just give him some coffee and he'll be fine. Yeah, I, I love Holden is a huge fan of coffee. And someone on our Google Plus group put, spoiler, Holden loves coffee. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. It's like, okay, this person obviously listened to the last episode where I went on my little spiel about not posting spoilers. <laughs> And that's that's an okay spoiler. That might be a spoiler. I don't. But I mean, it doesn't ruin anything. To no. Because <laughs> the first time you see him, you're probably going to find out he loves coffee. Right. Like him and Janeway should get together and open a a coffee roasting business or something. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> I don't know if we mentioned this, um, but on the Canterbury, he is an executive officer. Yes. Does that mean that he doesn't actually do the physical hauling and he just kind of orders it? kind of uh, directs it, so to speak? I don't know. I don't know. I'm under the impression that he did do that. Okay. But I don't know for sure. I'd have to go reread it. It's been a while since I've read the first book, although I'm I'm intending to start reading it again here any day. Uh, but my just impression from what I remember is that the crew is small enough that it's kind of an all hands on deck, kind of like everybody helps out. You know, okay. But I could be wrong, but but that's kind of my impression. That would make sense. I mean, you want to be efficient and make the most money in the shortest amount of time in yeah. that kind of a job. Yeah. And, you know, in space, you don't have room for any dead weight. Like everybody's probably serving multiple functions on a crew because, you know, every, every body is more mass. You've got to accelerate. It's more oxygen and water you got to carry around. And mm-hmm. so, yeah. I just made the connection just now about him being in the Navy on ships and him being in space on ships. It's kind of neat that he jumped from Earth Navy to being in space and being one of the crew. Yeah, kind of a a similar role, but just uh, less reputable. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) All right. So, So, yeah, there's a little bit about Stephen Strait and his character, Jim Holden, who I'm very much looking forward to to seeing in action on December 14th and 15th. Yeah. I'm going to take this opportunity to mention that Steven is not on Twitter. And I also could not figure out what his official website is, if he has one. But a fun thing to do is to type in Steven Strait Expanse into Google and watch some of his interviews. Yeah, he's he's done quite a few of them. Yeah, and he always has interesting things to say about his role and how he prepares for it. So next week, we are going to be talking about Cass Anvar. Yay! Is that how you say his last name? That's how I say it. I don't. I could ask him. I'll ask him on Twitter. He plays the character Alex Camel, and I don't know how to say that. <laughs> or Kamal, maybe. I doubt it's Camel. I say Kamal in my head. Okay, yeah. Alex <laughs> Kamal. We'll say that sounds better than Camel. <laughs> Um, who is the pilot of the of the ship? And he is a Martian, and he's a really cool... Well, they're all really cool characters, but he's going to be a lot of fun to talk about, and Cass is awesome. I follow him on Twitter. 
Yeah, he's really, he's cool. really great with his fans. But we'll talk about him next week. So if you would like to reach us, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at expansepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. We've already gotten a lot of great feedback from listeners and some great ideas from people. I've, I've heard from a few people already who really want us to talk about the books more and are suggesting that maybe between the first and second season of the TV show, we could talk more about the books and even have maybe some spoilery episodes uh, as long as we just let people know that, hey, this episode's going to be full of spoilers. Uh, what do you think about that idea, Nikki? It might be fun to do a spoiler cast or two. I will say that I read a lot slower than you do, so I'm a little worried about that, but <laughs> it would yeah. still be fun. It would definitely be fun. I'm just, I'm, I'm a little concerned that it might cause problems just because of the spoilers. I mean, what if someone like downloads four episodes and they're just listening to them in their car? I mean, obviously we'd say at the beginning of the episode, but I, I don't know. I could just see it happening where someone listens to it and they, they don't mean to or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would really hate to ruin it for someone. But, but one thing that we have talked about is assuming the first season of the show wraps up the first book, which I'm not certain if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. But if that is true, maybe what we could do between the first season and the second season is talk about the first book and talk about maybe uh, things that didn't happen in the show that we're fairly confident aren't going to happen in the show that they just decided not to do mm -hmm. or maybe ways that things are different between the books and the show. So, so that might be interesting, but definitely let us know what you think because you know, right now, I would guess that a large percentage of our listeners have read the books or are reading the books, or maybe all of them have, right? Mm -hmm. But I think once the show comes out, that will become a smaller and smaller percentage of our listeners. Yes, and I agree. That kind of stuff may not be something that the people that don't read the books have any interest in, or it may they may be interested and be like, oh, I'm curious what happened in the books that we didn't see in the show. So especially if you're listening to this in the future, <laughs> beyond December 14th, shoot us an email, expansepodcast at gmail.com and, and let us know, would you like to hear more about the books or not? What do you think about there being spoiler episodes if they're clearly indicated? Is that something you're interested in or not? So yeah, I, I'd be curious what people think. You can also find us on Google Plus. Just search for Lex Starwalker or Nikki Starwalker. And we also have a Google Plus community that you can join uh, that's dedicated to The Expanse and, and this show. So you can get uh, updates about the podcast. And also anytime we find anything like an interview or something like that, Expanse related, we always post it there. And if you head to our website, starwalkerstudios.com slash expanse, there at the top of the page will be a nice red join our Google Plus community button. Just <laughs> click on that. It'll take you there. Um, and anybody can join. You don't have to have like a Google account or anything like that. And you don't have to join to read the stuff. You just have to join to comment. Oh, okay. So I, I know maybe some people out there aren't savvy with the Google Plus. They don't know what that's about. Um, but it's it's just like going to any other website. You can go there and, and read the stuff. And, and if you are inspired to contribute or comment, then then you can join. But it's literally the click of a button to join. So not hard to do. And there's already a lot of videos and pictures and, and all kinds of stuff there. Yeah. And I love posting fan art if I ever see that. For instance, I posted one a long time ago with Holden and his coffee cup <laughs> illustrated by a fan. So yeah, there's, there's some really been, fun ones out there. There has been some fantastic fan art done just recently that I've been seeing on Twitter. And that's another nice thing about following people involved with the show. Like Dominique Tipper is a great one. Like she'll retweet all kinds of fan art that people tweet at her. Mm-hmm. Um, which is awesome because I follow a lot of, quote, famous people on Twitter and very, very few of them do stuff like that. Yes, it's very neat. And of course, Cass, he seems to retweet yes. interviews yes. and anything anybody says about him, like, oh, I met Cass the other day, blah, blah, blah. He'll retweet that. And he yeah, seems very I just friendly. Don't, 
I don't want to get too much into cast because then we'll start talking about him and oh, we right. got to save that for next week. <laughs> okay. But yeah, there's lots to talk about about him. But yeah, he's a great person to follow too. He's very approachable and interacts with his fans, which which is awesome. And I, I mean, I get it. Like once you get to a certain point of fame, like you really can't right. do that anymore. But it's nice for the people that can that do because not all the ones that can do. And it's awesome for the ones that do. It's great for us as fans. Yes, we appreciate it. So definitely check out our website, starwalkerstudios.com. You can find the show notes for this show. You can also find our other podcasts there. Currently, we produce a show called Beer Tasters. It's all about craft beer. And uh, one of these days, we're going to get more into talking about home brewing on that show. And also Game Master's Journey which is a show I do about tabletop RPGs. And it's kind of uh, about tabletop RPGs in general, not a specific game. And uh, that's kind of cool because one thing I I find awesome about The Expanse is this started out, well, first as an MMO Mm -hmm. and then as an RPG. Um, Ty ran this and probably still does as an, an RPG setting which is awesome. So personally, I'm really hoping for an official Expanse role-playing game someday (laughs) and video games. Oh my God, how cool would that be? That would be a blast. Oh, you know, I almost forgot you, you mentioned uh, the fan art, Mm -hmm. Uh, another really cool little sketch that's on our Google plus community page is a sketch that someone did of the Rossi which if you don't know what that is, I'm not going to tell you because that could in itself be a spoiler, but it's a ship in in the series. We'll say that Mm -hmm. a a really cool ship. And, you know, it's just a fan sketch, but they did a really good job of capturing the description of it given in the book, which was a coffee mug with a wedge (laughs) on the end, which is what this sketch very much looks like. And I have been looking high and low for an actual tease of what the Rossi looks like, and I've not been able to find one. I actually tweeted James S.A. Corey today and asked him, is there something out there? Is there been an image of it released? And, and I haven't heard back. I just ch- checked. Haven't heard back from him. Um, <laughs> but I don't think there is. Uh, so I am really, really stoked to see what the Rossi looks like. Yeah, they must have that on lockdown. Yeah, well, what led to this is... Uh, I think it was actually Cass had said something about one of the sets oh, and, and how cool it was. And I think it was Daniel mm-hmm. mentioned that he took a nap in one of the bunks on the Rossi and like, <laughs> are awesome. we all jealous? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That would be a great like prize for like a sweepstakes or something. You get to take a nap on the Rossi. How cool would that be? <laughs> That's kind of funny though, because the rooms are so small. Right. It wouldn't be exactly luxurious. <laughs> right. It'd probably be like a bunk on a submarine, right? Right. Like there's literally room for you to lay down and that's it. You can't even sit up, <laughs> <laughs> but it'd still be cool. All right. Well, that's going to do it for, for us this week. Until next week, though, please conserve your oxygen and your water because resources are precious out in the outer solar system. So long, and thanks for all the fish. 